Masechet Nedarim Daf Mem Chet, and with this Daf we complete the fifth Perik of the Masechet. We have two more Mishnayot left. The first one says, Hareni Alecha Cherem Hamudar Asur. Hare At Alai Cherem Hanoder Asur. Hareni Alecha Veat Alai Shenehem Asurin. This part is pretty uh, obvious. If you have two people, uh, A and B, and A says, I am a, unto you as a cherem. Cherem means something that you dedicate to the Bet HaMikdash and therefore is prohibited to use. So he's not actually de- de- dedicating himself to the Bet HaMikdash. He's saying, I am prohibited to you like a cherem. In that case, hareni alecha cherem hamudar asur. I am prohibited to you. So therefore, A is making a prohibition that will apply to B. So hamudar, that's the object of the vow, B, will have a prohibition from receiving any benefit from A. The other way around, still A talking, if A says, you are to me as a cherem, in that case, hanoder, A, the one who is making the vow, he is is both both making the vow and is the object of the vow. He makes a prohibition upon himself from receiving any benefit from B. If A says, I am upon you eh, like a cherem, and you are upon me like a cherem, so then they are both prohibited from receiving <coughs> um, uh, benefit from each other. Right? It's possible for A to create prohibitions both ways by using that formula. Now, however, we have an exception. Ushnehem mutarim b'davar shel ole bavel, even if they each have a prohibition against benefiting from each other. If there is national property, uh, this is referred to in the Mishnah as that which those who came up from Bavel, when they came back from the exile, from Bavel to Eretz Yisrael, and they rededicated Yerushalayim and the Bet HaMikdash, uh, there were items, there, there were places and things there that they said, this is national property, it does not belong to any individuals. And so, therefore, everyone is permitted. However, but communal property uh, at a local level will be one can prohibit. So, A and B both live in the city, and A says, You can't benefit from me. Well, then B cannot benefit from that public property. The Gemara will further elaborate. What are these items? Those who went from Babel to Eretz Israel. After the after the first Bet Hamikdash and rebuilt the second Bet Hamikdash, so they declared Harabait, the entire Temple Mount and all of the courtyards and the cisterns that were on the way in the middle, the public cisterns that um, are in in the road leading to Jerusalem, so that whenever people come, Aliyah Laregel, they can benefit. They declared all that to be, in a way, hefked or ownerless but not in the sense that anyone can just come and take it, uh, but rather that it's it's not owned by any individual at all. This belongs to the entire nation collectively, and no one actually have, has a share in it. Uh, this might be something close to what we call in um, uh, modern day a, uh, a, a kind of a, a corporation, except that a corporation actually people do have a share of. So it's not quite a corporation. This is just like, uh, you know, who owns a national building? Right, nobody owns it, and um, it's it's governed by the national legislature, whatever it is. Okay, so this in this case, even if we're prohibited to each other, um, still we, we can both go into Harabait. That's not a problem. Uh, the, what are items that uh, belong to the city? That would be like the public mall. The mall. Every every city had a city square or the bathhouse, or the synagogue, or the Aron Kodesh, where that holds the Torah scrolls, or the Torah scrolls themselves. This is communal property, but it's a little different. Communal property is, is more like a, um, a partnership or a, uh, a, a corporation that is owned by several people, in which case everybody has a share, in a small share, in that communal property. Therefore, like a synagogue, uh, if we're, or we're both members of the synagogue in, in our local city, and you cannot have any benefit from me, well then, by entering into the synagogue, you are deriving benefit from my share of that synagogue, and vice versa, if we're both prohibited to each other, 
then we both cannot go into the synagogue. So this is different from national property that's not owned by anyone. Uh, this is owned partially by everyone in the city. And so this is going to be a problem. The next line, the Gemara is going to clarify, is actually a solution. If they have these A and B that are prohibited to each other, what they can do is they can transfer their right to the, to the synagogue or whatever other communal property to the Nasi. It says, I forego my share in the synagogue. I won't have any you know, decision-making responsibilities there. He can still then, and, and he says, I'll give it to the Nasi, the patriarch, the, that's the, the, the head of the Jewish community in the entire land of Israel. It will belong to him. My share belongs to him. In that case, since I don't have a share in the synagogue, you can enter the synagogue because you're not benefiting from me. And if you also do that, then I can I can enter the synagogue and because I'm not giving any I'm not getting any benefit from you. Okay, uh, this is not clear of Hakotev. It doesn't say this is what you should do. So the Gemara is going to ask about this Hakotev Chelko Nasi. What does that mean? Is that if I give something to Nasi, is that a continuation of the list of things that are prohibited? What is this doing here? And the Gemara will answer what we just said. Now, we have a machloket about how to do this. How do you transfer something to the Nasi? The Biyuda Omer, Echad Kotev La Nasi Ve'echad Kotev La Hedyot. Ma ben Kotev La Nasi Le Kotev La Hedyot? Sha Kotev La Nasi En Tzarich Le Zakot, La Hedyot Tzarich Le Zakot. So in fact, it doesn't have to only be that you one transfers the his right, uh, his share in the synagogue to the nasi. He actually could share the, we could um, uh, uh, transfer it to anybody. We could transfer it to another friend, a third party, and that would affect you with the same thing. As I, I just can't benefit from B, but as long as B transfers his right to C, then I can benefit from it. Uh, the thing is that there is still a difference. It's easier to transfer something to the nasi than to any other hejot, any other commoner. And what is the difference? She kotev la nasi. If I write it over to the nasi, I don't have to make a formal um, a formal transaction. I could just write on a paper, I hereby uh, am giving this uh, my share of communal property to the Nasi, and that's it. I don't have to do anything. Whereas if I'm giving it to someone else, then I have to write it down and I have to get someone else to receive it for me. If I'm giving it over to C, I could actually hand that over to C. Or if C is not around, I could just get anybody to say, listen, I'm giving this to you, D, uh, on, and I want you to acquire this on behalf of C. All right, that's, that's fine. But you, need to, you have to do some kind of formal act of acquisition. In general, that's true. Anytime you want to transfer property from one party to another, it's not enough just to say, hey, this is yours. You actually have to do something uh, if it's a movable item, you pick it up. If it's a field, uh, you uh, you gate it, uh, walk on it. You have to do something. And so this would be uh, for to transfer it to another person, you have to do that. The Nasi, on the other hand, since he's in charge of everything, kind of like, you know, when a, a, a king actually owns the whole country, right? And uh, if, you're, if you're there, because he lets you. So it's much easier to transfer something to a, a ruling body. Uh, the Nasi is not quite a king, but he has a lot of control over the people and the land and the institutions in, um, in Israel. And therefore, even just by writing it, according to some, even just by saying my my share belongs to the nasi that would be sufficient that's going to the buddha he, he's more lenient on this chamim say no it's the same thing if to transfer your share of the synagogue to a nasi or to a regular commoner as the same you have to do the formal transaction I'd have to write it down and give something to another party. The Nasi might not be around, uh, but I have to give it to someone says, take this on behalf of the Nasi. So you have to do that. So in that case, how come in the Mishnah, on this part of the Mishnah, it says you have to give it to the Nasi? It was just giving the most common situation. Most people, if they're going to get rid of, uh, relinquish their right, they want to give it to the Nasi. Because if they give it to the neighbor, well, now the neighbor owns your right to the synagogue. Now he can, if he gets angry at you, make a prohibition against you go, giving, going to the synagogue. Right? Whereas the Nasi, he's in charge of everything. And so anyway, he could, he could if he really wants to, 
he could excommunicate you and do other things. So giving it to the Nasi uh, just make, uh, gives, gives it to, uh, to that public official, and so that's usually a better option. But in fact, according to Chachamim, it would be the same procedure, giving it to the Nasi or to anyone else. You can see that there's two layers of this Mishnah. Uh, this part, which has no names in it, is the earlier layer. Uh, it says, gives the basic law. Right, there's no names throughout. And then uh, this machloket is discussing, well, what does that mean, Nasi? Rabbi Yudha is explaining, oh, Nasi is special. It's easier to give it to a Nasi. Hachamim say, no, Nasi is just any other, any old example. It's just more common. Another leniency that the Buddha says is that the people in the Galilee don't have to worry about this. They don't even have to write it that to give it over to the Nasi or to anyone else because their forefathers already did it for them. Now, there's the forefathers in, in Galil, they once upon a time, they all sat and declared, listen, all of our share in the synagogues and communal property, we're giving it all to the Nasi. And they did that once and for all, so that in the Galil, if two people prohibit each other from deriving benefit from the other, they can still go into the synagogue and they don't have to transfer because their shares are already transferred. The Gemara will explain why. Gemara, Amai Mitzar. The Gemara now is asking about this clause here of if someone writes his say his uh, share to the Nasi, this looks like it's another one, another part of the list of things that are um, that are within the city shared shared property in the city is prohibited. If if there's a vow between two people prohibiting each other, then they're also prohibited from Sifadim, and it looks like this is the next item. And also, someone who gives their their things to the Nasi, that also will be prohibited. Prohibited. That doesn't make sense. Why should something be prohibited to you if I gave it to the Nasi? That should make it permitted. And so that's the answer. What's the solution if you have a problem and now what am I going to do? I can't go to synagogue because I can't benefit from your share of the synagogue? Oh, we can both write uh, our shares to the synagogue, to the Nasi of the synagogue, and that way we can go. Uh, the next part of it is simply a word-for-word -word quote of the Mishnah. It does not add anything. It's curious that it's even here. Uh, maybe this was like a Dibura Matchil of the Mishnah um, and at a time when they didn't have the entire Mishnah. Right? Some, uh, some manuscripts of the Gemara are just Gemara. They didn't have the Mishnah interspersed uh, in between. And so if you don't have the Mishnah as we do, and the printed editions, Mishnah, and then the whole Mishnah, and then the whole Gemara. So um, you have to kind of know the Mishnah. So this might be a quotation of the Mishnah, kind of in the now doubled because we already have it here, but maybe it was originally here because we're about to um, explain the Biudah's opinion. So it's kind of maybe the Mishnah would split up differently. Anyway, for whatever reason, we have the Mishnah here. We'll just read it. Okay, the Biudah is more lenient when, when, with regard to transferring something to a Nasi. Uh, then to a commoner, and Chamim says it's the same. Uh, next clause, So now we're going to explain the background. How come the people in the Galilee do not have to transfer their share in synagogue to the Nasi um, because their forefathers already did it? Why did their forefathers already do that? That explains that the people in the Galilee were contentious, quarrelsome. They kept fighting with each other, and every time they fought, they would just swear and say, "You can have no, no, you can have no benefit from me." And the other one would say back, "Oh yeah, you can have no benefit from me." And now in the city, half the half the population, uh, no one can have benefit to, from each other. And now this is a problem because now none of them can go to the synagogue. None of them can go and read from the public sefer Torah. 
They can't go to the public bathhouse, right? There's going to be serious problems here. And so in that generation, they all said, listen, everybody, we're all transferring our share to the, of the communal property to the Nasi, right? So that way, if there's, a, I guess, a decision that has to be made about uh, moving the synagogue or anything, the Nasi will have to decide um, because they all gave their share to the Nasi. And that way, well, they're still going to have interpersonal problems about you know, going over each other's houses, but at least it will solve the communal problem and so that was done once and for all, and uh, therefore even future generations um, can go to the synagogue even if they made a vow against each other. And now, last Mishnah. We saw most of this Mishnah already. Um, a is angry at B and says, I'm not going to give you any benefit. But then B is down and out, he's poor, he has nothing to eat, or they're you know, in the middle of the desert, and B has nothing to eat, and A wants to help him out. After all, they're probably friends, he just got angry. So here's what they could do. Um, he can, a can give it to a third party as a gift, and then the third party can give it to B, uh, um, and that would be permitted uh, because it's going indirectly, right? So as long as A gives it to a third party, um, that's not the food itself that's prohibited. It's just that he cannot have any benefit from A, but now that, that it's given to someone else, B can benefit. And now we have a story. There was a story about a father and son that weren't getting along. They lived in the city, a poor city um, uh, called Bet Choron. And uh, the father was, this is no dead, but it, 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 they mean the opposite, um, Nadur, that the father had a vow against him from the son. Right? The son told the father, uh, I'm not giving you any benefit. Um, son got angry at the father. And then that son was marrying off his son. So now they're going to make a wedding. Right? This guy who made the vow is making a wedding for his son. But after some time, he actually wants his father to be there. So how can he do that when he has a vow? He can't invite the father to come and eat from his, uh, from his ceremony. So the one who made the vow, who's making the party for his son, he goes to a friend and says, listen, I am giving you my courtyard and everything, or the entire wedding meal, they are yours. I'm, I'm gifting it to you. So that, or only so that, Ella sounds like a condition, uh, so that my father can come and eat with us at the meal. And so this would so it looks like it's a it's a story that's an example of what we just said, right? Two people, one wants to give to the other, but there's a vow, so you give it to a third party. That's exactly what he's doing here. He's giving it to a third party. It would seem like this would be good, but here we run into a problem. That third party uh, who receives this, this uh, gift of the courtyard and the whole meal says, well, if they're mine, then I decide I'm going to make everything hekdesh. He, he literally donates all of the food to, uh, to the Bet HaMikdash. And now, now it's not usable. No one is allowed to eat any of that food. So now this guy basically ruined the party. Now the host, the person who made the vows, making the party, says, I, you think I gave them to you so that you could make it all prohibited and donate it to Shamaim? That's not why I gave it to you. I wanted to make a party and just invite my father. So why did he do it? He explains, the one who, who, uh, who uh, the, the recipient, the friend who was the recipient of this present says, I know why you gave it to me. You gave me what's yours only so that you and your father can sit and eat and drink and have fun together. And this is against your vow, right? I know you're using me as a loophole to go around your vow, but it's not going to work this loophole because you don't really mean to give it to me as a gift. And now it's going to be a sin. And who's going to get the sin? I am, he says, his on his head, because no one wants to say that the sin will come upon me. So he uh, uses a third person pronoun. But he means that I'm going to get the sin for you using me to uh, override the law. And I'm not interested. And that's why I donated everything to heaven. Would have been nice if he said this before. 
that he just he doesn't want to be the recipient, right? But maybe he thought of it afterwards. And so you see that this led into a problem. Um, and Amru uh, Chachamim, after that happened, the rabbi said a new decree. They said, in general, any gift of this sort that the person who made the vow gives to a third party in order to give to the object of the vow, if um, it, if the the the, uh, the third party would consecrate it. Um, and uh, the person would have a problem with it, right? Uh, that if the third party made a hektesh and A would say, oh, I guess he made a hektesh, what can I do? Um, then it's okay. But if any case where A would object and said, I didn't give it to you to make hektesh, I only gave it to you in order to give it to the other person. In that case, it was not a sincere gift. It has to be a total gift, right? This is a loophole, and the loophole can work as long as you really mean to give it over. And so if you have um, uh, three people that are, you know, just uh, traveling somewhere and A wants to give something to B and instead he gives it to his friend C and C says, oh, it's Hekdesh. And he says, well, look, I really gave it to you. I was hoping you would give it to B, but now you make it Hekdesh, it is Hekdesh. And he says, he's fine. What could I do? In that case, it's a real gift. And uh, that would be fine. But if there's any case, and this here is kind of obvious, it's a whole wedding meal, right? Well, no one would really think that he wants his wedding meal to be prohibited to all the guests. So, um, so any place where it's clear from the from the context and from the people that he would not want the third party, it would not be okay with the third party making a dish. And he says something like this: "I didn't give it to you for that reason. I would never have given it to you." Um, in that case, it's not really a, not a real gift, right? Like we mentioned once before, if you're selling your chametz on Pesach, look, if it's a real sale, then it's not in your property, so you're not violating 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 anything. But the the challenge is, if the non Jew you're selling it to decides not to give it back to you, are you going to say, wait, that was only a fake sale, I didn't really give it to you, or are you going to object? Well, that means you didn't I never gave it over. Um, so if the non Jew would say, you know what, I'm going to comes over and takes uh and takes some of your uh, noodles on Pesach itself and you're like okay it's yours it's total then then it means that you were sincere so that's what the rabbis are saying here also all right that's the Mishnah now here's our analysis Maaseh Listor what, what is this Mishnah? This Mishnah at first, see, it, see, it seems to uh, contradict itself. At first it says, as long as you give it to a third party, it's permitted. And then it gives the story where it was a problem and he didn't really mean to give it and it was, it was not valid. It was not a valid gift. And, and therefore the rabbis prohibited it. So which one is it? Is it permitted to use the third party loophole or prohibited from use, to use the third party loophole? Okay, I mean, I think a simple reading of the Mishnah is that Technically, it's allowed. At first, it was allowed, but then this happened, and then the rabbis made a takana. This is no, you know what? It's not going to be allowed anymore. Um, but um, but the Gemara is asking about this anyway, perhaps because not that so much that the Chachamim are making a takana, but rather they're clarifying that uh, you can only do this when you're sincere. So usually, when you have a mishnah, it has a law, and then a story. The story should be. Uh, providing a good example for the law. Here's a, an application of where it works or why it works or how we a source. Um, so there should be um, there should be continuity between the law and the story that they support each other. And here is the opposite, Maser Listor. This happens actually often enough in the Mishnah that this is a phrase that happens very uh, uh, that happens somewhat often that the Gemara will ask about the Mishnah. Uh, and in fact, sometimes the stories are there precisely to say the opposite. Okay, so Gemara is going to explain. Here is how you understand the flow. We're reading it as if there's missing words in the Mishnah. In general, yes, you can use a third party uh, to get a loophole around the vow, give it to them to give, give this to, give it to them to give it to the person who's the object of the vow. But... Um, here's the missing words that you have to add in that's implied. If the end of what he does shows that the, he was not sincere at the beginning, then it's prohibited, right? If something at the end shows, oh, I didn't, I never, I, I changed my mind, I never wanted to give that to you, and he objects like he does in this story, then that shows that it was never sincere and it was never good all along. So the Mishnah, the, the story here is actually giving a clarification. And so the story 
is coming to exemplify these missing words. Okay, so I don't think it means that the, here that the words are actually went missing in transmission, uh, but rather it's kind of obvious after you, you have to fill this in. This is the general rule, but then the story gives a caveat that the rule will not always work, for example, in this type of case. Amarava, lo shanu ela damar le vehinan lefanecha ela kede sheavo abba. Rava is going. We're going to have two versions of what Rava says. One, this one is more lenient. The next one is going to be more stringent. This lenient one is putting a limitation on the law of the Mishnah, the final law, the law that says you can't do this loophole. Rava says, when is this loophole a problem? A problem. Only when he says, like he says in the story, here, this is you, this is for you, A, the person that made the vow, tells the tell C, the person who he's giving to as a gift, these are yours only so that you can give it to my father. Right? If he says that in the wedding case, um, this is yours on condition that you give it to my father, then that's no good. That's obvious that he really wants to only give it to his father, and he doesn't mean the gift at all, and therefore that's actually um, benefiting the father and is not 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 good. That's a violation. But if uh, the host says to the third party receiver, "This these are yours. The meal is yours." Uh, so that father will come. In that case, he's he's not saying it on condition. He's saying, I hope, right? It's up to you, up to your judgment. I'm giving this to you, and it would be my wish that my father would be able to come. In that case, the host can say no. He says, no, I, I, I decide I'm not going to invite your father. I'm going to invite someone else. So it's not a conditional gift. As long as it's an unconditional gift, then you can still express and say, you know, but I'd really like your father, my, my father to come. That's still okay. That's the first version of Rava. The second version is the opposite. It says, uh, Rava says, Do not think that the only reason in the Mishnah that it was a problem is because he said, Here, this is your, this is a gift to you. It's missing, it does not, it's, um, Da, da, da. Uh, you have to fill in the rest of the sentence. These, this, this meal is yours on condition, right? Ella, uh, don't think that that's the only reason it's prohibited in this story because he made a condition. But if he said, here, these are yours so that, uh, that hopefully you'll invite fa my, my father, um, and then that would be permitted. In other words, don't think the first version of Rava. Even if he used the more general language with unconditional language and said, this is yours and uh, may father come. Uh, my father should come. That also would be prohibited. Because even if he doesn't say those words, um, the meal itself it proves what his intention is. Uh, it's obvious that he's not giving over his courtyard and his whole big wedding that he just made as a gift. Nobody would do that. It's obvious that he's giving it only as a loophole, and so therefore this legal fiction does not work. Um, okay, it seems I would follow Rambam here that says, even if he didn't say anything at all, even if he just said in the case of the wedding, it just said, this is yours. It's already obvious to anyone looking and to themselves that there is, this is not a real gift. It has to be a case uh, where um, it's something, you know, smaller or whatever, then it's possible that A would want to give a gift to that third party, right? If they're, if they're out and they're, they have a picnic or something and t together and A has an extra sandwich and he says, here, C, I want you to have this sandwich. Um, so it could very well be that he would give it to, to C. Um, in that case, and then he can add, oh, by the way, I have a prohibition. I can't give uh, B anything if it, if you please. Um, and would give it to B, I think that would be uh, that would be nice, a nice thing for you to do. That's permitted because there, uh, the context shows that he could, he he, he might be okay with giving uh, C the gift. In that case, it would be it would be permitted, right? But all would depend on context, and the, the language uh, would not make a difference. 
Um, if the context shows that he doesn't really mean it, then even saying the language with a condition or even without a condition would still be prohibited. So that is Rava. So the first, uh, the first case of Rav is limiting the prohibition of the Mishnah, and so therefore allowing, being more permissive. The second one takes, uh, takes the Mishnah pretty literally and says, no, it's absolutely pro- prohibited. Um, as long as in the end he would not want it to be a real gift and we can tell that from the context that it's not a real gift and it violates the vow. All right, now here's the next case we're going to have some debate about. This guy had a son who was a thief. He was uh, stealing uh, sheaves of flask, of flax. He leave out the flax, has to soak for a while. He's going around and stealing people's flax. The father was very upset about his son's behavior. The father made a vow that the son, son, you cannot benefit from any of my property. Right? That's it. So then the son is basically disinherited. People came to the father to try to reconcile and said, if your grandson would be a Torah scholar, what would you want? In other words, now you're punishing not only your son, but you're also punishing your son's children, because if your son doesn't inherit, then your grandchildren aren't going to inherit your property. But what if your grandchild is an upstanding Tamit uh, Chacham? Wouldn't you want the money to go to him? The father says, "You're right. I would want my grandfather, my grandson, to have it if he's a, if he turns out to be a Torah scholar. So you know what? Let my son have it, but not. But my son cannot uh, benefit from it. He will just take ownership um, uh, for now. And if my grandson turns out to be." A, a tamid chacham, then my grandson can acquire it and he'll be able to enjoy it. So I'll let my son just be a holder, um, uh, kind of uh, uh, in escrow uh, for the time being. So now that's the question. My does that violate the terms of the vow? Is that kind of passing since it's passing through uh, the the person who's prohibited to someone permitted? Is that is that okay? So this case is interesting because it's a kind of variation of the previous one. In the previous one, A wants to give something to B who is prohibited to, and he's going to use C. Who is permitted to? So he's using a the 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 go between the middleman is permitted, so that way it can go from to the permitted person and then to the prohibited. This is switching around B and C. He wants to give something to someone who he's permitted to give it to, but he wants to use the person who he made a vow against as the middleman. But the middleman is not uh, directly benefiting from it, and therefore maybe it's permitted. But maybe not. Uh, so the Gemara is going to deal with the vow issue, but also with the just the legal mechanism in terms of monetary law. Can you do that? Is it possible to transfer money through someone else who is not actually going to acquire it in the middle? That's going to be a more general question. So Amri Pumpetitae, the people, the sages from Pumpetita said, Kene amenat laknotu, Vechol kene amenat laknot lakane. They said, this is a transfer on condition that the receiver retransfers it. And anything like this is not a transfer. Uh, in other words, if I want to give you something, here, take this, uh, so that then you will at some point give it to someone else, that's okay. Um, right, I'm asking you, here, take this. Would you mind passing it to someone else? That's okay. But if I give it to you on condition that you give it to someone else, but you're not going to acquire it in the meantime. So you're like you're zero. You don't have ownership. Well, in that case, I only made this transaction with you, but not with the ultimate receiver. So no transaction ever happened, and therefore it's not a valid transaction. And so these sages say this is the same thing. Since uh, the father is not allowed to give the son anything, and so he's saying, you know, just hold it, but it's not really going to be yours. And then after maybe 20 years, when that grandson grows up, uh, should, should he be, maybe he will be, should he be a Tamit Chacham, only then, and by, by that time, maybe the father died. And so now the son, who has this kind of inheritance in limbo, but cannot actually acquire it for himself because there's a vow against it. How is that going to work on a technical 
uh, level of uh, what, 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 by what legal mechanism, what financial mechanism can he transfer it to his son if he didn't own it himself. Therefore, no, it does not work. Um, so they don't think it's a problem with the vow. They just think that the transfer never transfers. Uh, Rav Nachman disagrees and says this is a valid transaction and he proves it from a Kenyan Sudar. Kenyan Sudar is very important. We actually use it till today often. It's, uh, it's kind of a barter, but instead of bartering two items of equal value, I give you just a symbolic thing, like a handkerchief. And by giving you this handkerchief, then you transfer over to me or to someone else something of a lot of value, but it may not be around. It might be a piece of land or something that's not near us. So if I want to acquire that land, and we're not around, we're not there, so we just do this Kinyan Sudar. Uh, we do it today in weddings. The rabbi, on behalf of the wife, of the bride, will give the groom a... Um, a, 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 a handkerchief, and by that the groom transfers to the wife all of the obligations that he has agreed to in the ketubah. So in that case, usually the groom, let's say, will give give the handkerchief back to the rabbi uh, or whatever. It's two people, so the receiver of the handkerchief, the sudad, will give it back, right? Because it was his to begin with, and he just gives it back. And so you see, Rav Nachman says, "Look at that. Uh, the, a, this handkerchief that's used is is being uh, transferred only in order." to transfer ownership. I'm giving you this handkerchief so that on condition that by you taking this uh, handkerchief, then that land will be mine. Even though then the handkerchief resorts to, goes back to me. And so you see that this is um, the same thing, that it can affect the transfer even though you never actually take ownership of the handkerchief. Therefore, this is permitted. And the same thing would be here that the son of the, the of the father who was the thief, um, even though he is just holding it for symbolic reasons in the meantime as a middleman and eventually just to take giving the inheritance to his son, that's permitted, even though it never actually becomes his, just like the handkerchief never fully becomes yours. You're just doing a symbolic acquisition of the handkerchief, but you don't you have to give it back. Um, and uh, so too, this, that son who is a thief never acquires it for himself. He's just doing a temporary holding of it to his son that works. Since Kinyan Sudad works, it will also work in this case. So that's the main machloket here. Rav Nachman is going to be more lenient and say uh, that the son who's a thief can be the, uh, the medium of transfer. And the other sages are going to say it's no good. Amar Rav Asher. Rav Asher is going to challenge Rav Nachman on two counts. Uman le malan de sudara itafes le lamitpas. First of all, who told you that in the Kenyan Sudar that the person who takes the handkerchief cannot keep it? Um, it usually happens that he gives it back because it's my handkerchief I had it in my pocket. I'm just used it for this transfer, but you, you already have your own handkerchief. And so you're going to give it back to me. But technically, if I gave it to you, maybe you can keep it, right? Usually the bride's family is going to bring a handkerchief and then um, and uh, and the rabbi will use it. Um, uh, and so usually give it back. But technically, if the husband says, thank you for the handkerchief, I'm going to keep it, he can. And so maybe it really is a full transfer of the handkerchief not just a temporary symbolic uh, transfer that has to be given back. And so therefore, your analogy, your proof is no proof at all. Furthermore, There's another difference. If it, in the Kenyan Sudar, even if you say that, yeah, you have to give the Sudar back, that Kenyan Sudar works right away. Right? I say, take this handkerchief so that I will acquire that field. And as soon as you take the handkerchief, I acquire the field immediately. Right? So this is a symbolic act that will effectuate that transaction now. And so even if, that, even if you're not keeping the sudad, just by doing this action, uh, it's transferring now. That's very different from this case here where um, these, this inheritance, when is that grandson going to, uh, to take it, take hold of it? 
only once he, he might not even be born yet, or he might be a little kid, only once he grows up and becomes a Tamid Chacham, and by that time, the, the Sudar already went back. In this case, there's no Sudar, but it means that the, uh, the, the, the grandfather is already gone. He's out of the picture. Maybe he died. He's not around. And so, if it's happening simultaneously, then I can understand, right? Let's say it's all happening right now, that the father would give it to the son and say, right now, I want you to accept this on behalf of your son, right? And so by accepting this, it'll, it'll go to your son. That may, might, be, might very well be okay. That will be similar to the Kenyan Sudad. But can I do a Kenyan Sudad here? Pick up this handkerchief now, and then in 10 years, right, maybe uh, this land will be yours. That is completely different. You can't compare these two cases. So Rav Asher said, Sorry, Rav Nachman, your, your analogy, Kenyan Sudad, is no good. And I think that in the case of this, uh, the son who's a flax, a flax thief is prohibited. He cannot use this loophole. Amale Ravad Rav Nachman. The rabbis are really piling on Rav Nachman. Another challenge against him. matenat bet choron te kane almenat laknotu. Velo ka kane. So look at the example, Rav tells Rav Nachman, look at the example of the Mishnah, of the bet choron, where the host um, gives the gift to this uh, his friend on condition that the friend will invite the father. So basically saying here, this, you know, along, among the whole meal, there's going, to, uh, there's going to be one portion that he's giving to this third party in order that the third party will invite and give it to the father. And so that's a kind. That's uh, that's the same thing that um, you know. Since I'm giving it to you on condition that you give it to my father, so then uh, you never actually own it on your own. Because if you own it on your own, then you didn't get to my father. Then it was never a transfer. It was never a gift. So therefore, you're kind of just you, the middleman who was never actually owning it, but it's going through you to my father. And what do we say in the Mishnah? The Mishnah says this is no good. I didn't. I didn't mean it. I didn't mean for you. If I didn't mean that you have full ownership over it to do whatever you want, that you could make it a dish or you could do it all yourself, um, then it's not an actual kinyan. And so we see that it does not work. If it does not work in the case of the Mishnah, then also the your case of the flax thief is the same thing. Uh, the flax thief cannot own it. There's a vow against him, uh, that son, and therefore it cannot go through him to his uh, to the grandson. So that's Rav Nach- that's Rav's challenge here. This one he is going to answer. Rav Nachman, in fact, gave two different answers because this question came up at different times. Um, and so Rav Nachman's first answer is Sometimes when he was asked, Rav Nachman would say, "No, don't bring me a proof of the Mishnah." In the Mishnah. The context is clear. He made a whole big wedding uh, feast. Obviously, he's not going to, he doesn't want to give away his wedding feast. He doesn't mean to give it at all. Um, uh, so that's that's why that's the problem. He didn't mean it as a gift at all. That's different from our case where the grandfather uh, really did want to give his inheritance to the grandson. Right? It's very clear. He, he wants to give it away. And uh, therefore, that's, that's permitted. Right? The problem in the case of the Mishnah was not the method mechanism of transfer. The problem was that he never wanted to give it at all. But if he wanted to give it, then yes, you can give it to a third party. Even uh, uh, you can give it to, through a middleman, even though the middleman does not take full acquisition. So that's his answer. Other times, Rav Nachman gave a different answer. He says that no, I think that the Mishnah is actually the opinion of Rabbi Eliezer, who is very stringent. If we remember. Eliezer is, uh, Eliezer is the one that said, um, if I make a vow that you cannot benefit from me, then you can't even walk through my field. Usually, um, if I have a field, I don't mind if people uh, uh, go through. If there's a shortcut and they're not ruining, ruining anything, then, and they want to just go through. i do not going to charge them. I'm not going to put up a toll booth and charge them a fee. And so this is a negligible item. Nevertheless, Rabbi Eliezer says, if there's a vow that you can't benefit from me, then no, even that negligible item, people care about that, and that would be called um, a benefit and would be prohibited. So we see Rabbi Eliezer is very stringent in anyone receiving prohibition. That's why he's the author of the Mishnah, and he would say 
that um, any type of, uh, of, of uh, transaction through a third party would still be a little bit of a benefit. Um, this is not exactly a case of vitur. If, I'm, if uh, the guy is giving the meal to his, to his friend to give to his father, it's not exactly vitur. But the point is that, just like Rabbi Eliezer is very stringent on that, he would also be stringent in giving it even in an indirect way. That's why he's the author of this Mishnah, but everybody else would be okay with it. And that's why Rav Nachman says, I think it's okay to, um, uh, to, for, to uh, give for the father, for the grandfather, to give this item to his grandson. Okay, and finally, we're going to clarify the um, uh, one more item. Tenan, amru chachamim kol matana she'ena. Shim ikdisha temekodeshet ena matana. The last part of the Mishnah um, said that this is the general rule. Anytime you have a gift that uh, that if it would be that the person you gave it to would make it a dish and you would say, no, I don't want, uh, I have a problem with that, then that's not a real gift. Okay, when we say call, why does the Mishnah have to say, add the extra word call? Usually call is going to include yet another case. Is it not to include the case of the flax? And this would be another challenge to, against Rav Nachman. Because if we include this call matana, anytime I don't mean it, it's not a gift. And that would include the case of the flax. Because the father, the grandfather, does not want to actually give it to his son. And uh, there, and, and wouldn't want the son to make it efket. He wants it to go to his grandson, and therefore would include this case and be prohibited. Uh, would not work. Uh, so isn't this a challenge to Rav Nachman, who was lenient on that case? Rav Nachman could answer la la tu yelishana batraa tishma te derava. No, maybe that call is coming to say that we follow the second version of Rava's opinion. Uh, remember, Rava's first uh, um, opinion was to give a limitation on the Mishnah and say the Mishnah's case is only of the wedding feast is only a problem if he said on condition, but if he said, I'm giving it to you so that you give it to my father, but it's up to you, then I'll be permitted. And so um, Ram Nachman could say, no, I think the word call is not coming to exclude my case. My case of the flax is permitted. The word call is coming to teach that we follow the second version of Rava that there's no circumventing, no matter what language you say, even if you make it, make it unconditional, um, if the context shows that you would not actually want to, would not, would not want to give it over as a gift, then that would make it prohibited. Hazan alach hashutafin.